So this is chapter 15, section two. Again, we're still looking at pH. Uh, we are gonna focus on titrations here, pH indicators, uh, and do some titration calculations. So acid-base indicators, they change colors because they're sensitive to pH. And the colors uh, changes either because of the weak acid or weak base. So when you see this abbreviation that is like this, IN, that is indicator. So H indicator would be your acid indicator, breaks into the hydrogen ion and your indicator anion. Um, they are going to be different colors in an acidic solution. Most of the indicators are H, I, N, and in basic, most of them are just the indicator and ion. So again, I, N is for indicator. Uh, the pH range over which the indicators change colors is called a transition interval. And the color change at a pH lower than 7 are going to be your stronger acids than any other type of indicator. And they tend to ionize more than others. And indicators that undergo a transition in the higher pH range are considered weaker acids. You also have a pH meter that determines the pH of a solution. This uses two electrodes to do that. The voltage change as the hydrogen ion concentration in the solution changes, and the pH is more precisely indicated. It's better than indicators. Now we're going to look at several indicators, uh, what titration type they are best suited for, and then their color change. So not necessarily that you need to draw all of these pictures, but I would at least write down the titration type, the name of the indicator, and the range of their color change. Um, for this first set, if I'm looking at methyl red, again, you see your base color, transition color, your acid color, so it's going from a pale yellow to a pink, brom, uh, brom thymol blue here. Uh, you see its range, and again, if you're, and I, I, first one I was doing is a higher pH to a lower pH. If I were doing higher pH to lower pH, and I st stuck with that throughout all of the description, this one goes from a darker blue to a yellow, but you see what I'm saying here. So if you have a strong acid, strong base titration, meaning you're putting a strong acid and strong base together, these might be uh, two different indicators that you would want to use. The next one is a strong acid and a weak base. So let's say you got hydrochloric acid and ammonia. Then you could use methyl orange and bromphenol blue. You can see their indicator ranges. A weak acid and a strong base. Um, so maybe acetic acid with sodium hydroxide, phenylphthalein. That has a change up between 8 and 10, phenol red, 6.4 to 8. So now, since it's saying a strong base weak acid, you need some changes that are going to be above that 7 range since you have your strong base. Uh, titrations. These, uh, this is a neutralization occurring when your hydronium ions and hydroxide ions are supplied in equal numbers by reactants. So hydronium plus hydroxide is going to give you water, and that's a balanced equation. This is a controlled addition and measurement of the amounts of solution of known concentration required to react completely with a measured amount of solution of unknown concentration. So you will have a known concentration and amount that you would put together with a measured amount of your unknown concentration. Sorry about that. Okay, back to it. Equivalence point. This is when you have two solutions using titration that are present in chemically equivalent amounts. And the point in a titration in which your indicator changes color is the end point of the indicator. Indicators that undergo transition. At about a pH of 7 are used to determine the equivalence point of strong acid, strong base titrations. And we just looked at um, indicators used for a strong acid, strong base titration. The neutralization of strong acids with a strong base produces salt. Therefore, your solution will have a pH of about 7. 
Indicators that change color at a pH lower than 7 are used in your strong acid weak base titrations. So their equivalence point is going to be on the acidic side. And indicators used to change color at a pH higher than 7, this would be for a weak acid strong base. So your equivalence point should be on the basic side of things. If we were to put a drawing to this, and I do want you to understand these graphs that are on this slide and the next slide. If you had a strong acid, strong base. So strong acid, strong base. Notice your equivalence point is basically right there at a pH of seven. You have a very shallow line here at the bottom, a very long change where your equivalence point is met that goes straight vertical for many pH points, and then again, a very shallow line once you get up there to your base. So on this one, if we were looking at a weak acid and a strong base, Notice in your weak acid, it's no longer a shallow line. You have a lot of curve to this line where you have your weak acid that you're starting with. When you reach your equivalence point, which is above seven, your equivalence point above seven because you're with a strong base, uh, you're not spending a lot of time in that vertical range there, but then you get to a very shallow line once you get over here to your strong base because you've added more. So you have a weak acid that you are adding a strong base to. Now, what would this graph look like if you had a weak base with a strong acid? So it would look similar to this, but it's definitely going to be different. So that is another one that you could think about, and I'm sure within your homework it's going to be asked. So looking at molarity and titration together, a solution that contains the precisely known concentration of a solute is your standard solution. The primary standard is a highly purified solid compound used to check the concentration of the known solution in a titration. And this standard can be used to determine the molarity of another solution by titration. So we're gonna go through all of the steps for, for performing a titration. You're gonna see a lot of pictures, but for me, it's gonna be more important that you get the written steps in your notes. So this is what we are using. This is called a burette. Uh, the burette is a long, slender glass tube that is uh, has several precise uh, scaled marks on it whenever we are doing your calculations. So that was step number one, by the way, if you didn't catch that. So step number one, uh, label the burettes, rinse the burette three times with the acid to be used in the titration, use the base solution to rinse the other burette in a similar manner. So one side you rinse in acid, the other one you rinse in your base. Step number two, fill the acid burette with your acid solution to a point above the zero milliliter mark. Number three, release some acid into a waste flask to lower the volume until the calibrated portion of the burette. So you're bringing it down to make sure that you are within the scaled mark. Step four, record the volume of the acid in the burette to the nearest one hundredth of a milliliter. Five, read the volume of your acid into, or release the volume of acid into a clean Erlenmeyer flask and again, this would be stated how much. Six, record your new volume and subtract the starting volume to find the volume of acid added. Step seven, add three drops of your appropriate indicator. This example is adding phenylphthalein, which is a clear indicator that will turn pink at some point. Step eight, fill the other burette with a standardized base solution. Record it. Step nine, release some base from the burette into your waste flask. Step 10, record this volume to the nearest one hundredth of a milliliter. Step 11, place the flask under your base burette. Step 12, slowly release some base from the burette into the flask. And you are constantly swirling your flask. And you might get to a point where you're just doing a drop at a time. And the pink color should fade with swirling. 
so it should fade with swirling. So step 12 is important, and you want to take time during step 12 and in step 13. Step 13, near the end point, add your base drop by drop. So in that pink color, in this case, looks like it is staying around for a little while. Step 14, the end point is reached when you have a very light pink color that still remains even after 30 seconds of swirling. So steps 12, 13, and 14, very important. Step 15, record the new volume and determine the volume of base added. So now we are going to look at an example. Let's say you were doing this titration in class. Uh, what's the math that goes behind this? So determine the molarity of an acidic solution. Let's say you have 10 milliliters of hydrochloric acid by titration. We're going through the steps. Number one, we want you to titrate the acid with a standard base solution. So you're going to use 20 milliliters of 0 0.005 molar sodium hydroxide to titrate with. So in this one, we're doing basically just the opposite of what the performing a titration said. In theirs, they started with the acid and then added the base. In this one, we're going to start with the base and figure out how much acid to add um, as far as our titration goes. So we've got step number two, write a balanced neutralization reaction. So hydrochloric acid plus sodium hydroxide gives you a salt plus water. So this is essentially a double replacement reaction. This is balanced. So all of our coefficients are one or we have one mole of each of these. And then it says determine the chemi uh, chemically equivalent amounts of HCl and sodium hydroxide. Now I'm going to show you mathematically how the PowerPoint breaks down each of these steps. And then I'm going to show you what I would do if we were doing basically one of our stoichiometry problems, how we combine all of this into one grid. So again, it is saying start with a balanced equation, determine the equivalent amounts of acid and base, determine the moles of acid or base. Again, it just depends on which way you're coming from, from the known solution during the titration. Determine the moles of solute of your unknown, and then determine the molarity of the unknown. So these four steps, besides your balanced equation, I'm setting up within a grid. So let's get to this actually in a grid. So there is my balanced equation. If I go back and I look at the information that was originally given, I have 20 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, and I have 5 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. That is like saying 0 0.005 molar. And we know that molarity is really moles per liter. So I'm going to change that unit and put moles per liter as the molarity of sodium hydroxide. I know I need to work in liters too. So that 20, millilit 20 milliliters is really 0 0.02 liters. And underneath my acid, for hydrochloric acid, I know that I have 10 milliliters of it, which is really 0 0.01 liters. And it wants us to determine the molarity of our acidic solution. So we are trying to find molarity. Again, that is moles per liter. I can set this up as a stoichiometry problem that we would work with. So starting with my sodium hydroxide, I would start with the 0 0.02 liters of NaOH. I know this is going to be several steps, so I'm going to go ahead and work it out here. Uh, we need liters of NaOH to go to moles of NaOH. So if I'm looking back at the four steps on the previous slide, we did step one, start with the balanced equation and determine the chemically equivalent amounts. So the 20 milliliters, the 10 milliliters, those are chemically equivalent amounts of acid and base. Step two is determine the moles of acid or base. In this case, it's the moles of base from your known solution used during the titration. So this step is getting us to the number of moles of base, but using the information that is given. So that is point. 
0.005 moles per one liter. 0.005 moles per one liter. Now, in the next step, because again, cancels, cancels, I've got moles of NaOH. Step number three says determine the moles of solute of the unknown solution. This is where we're going to do our mole to mole ratio. So moles of base to moles of acid. And I'm going to throw in my coefficients. Well, all of my coefficients up top are a bunch of understood ones. So that is 1 over 1. So moles of our base here cancel out. Moles of HCl. The last step is determine the molarity of the unknown solution. So if I'm going to determine the molarity, I need it. Molarity is moles per liter. And this is for our HCl. Moles per liter of our HCl. I need this moles of HCl to stay because I need it in my answer. So that means I just need the liters portion. Well, for HCl, I know that I have 0.01 liters of HCl that I have used. 0.01 liters of HCl that I've used that was given. This gives me my mole per liter. So a little different than ones we've worked out before. You could do it separate steps like it showed you in the PowerPoint. Uh, I am more comfortable working out everything in, as a stoichiometry here. So that's what I'm doing. So nothing will actually go above the 0.01. We do multiply everything on top, divide by any numbers that you see on bottom, and your final answer is going to be 0 0.01 moles per liter or 1 times 10 to the negative 2 molarity, HCl. Again, if you're doing your scientific calculator, you may have left everything in scientific notation to start with, but that is the same answer. Show all of your work regardless of what you decide to do. So here's another example. I want you to get this written down. I'm going to scroll through real quick um, those four steps that it says to do. Determine your chemically equivalent amounts. Determine moles of your acid or base. Determine moles of solute of unknown. Determine molarity of unknown. I will go through what the PowerPoint has, but then I will go back and I will show you using stoichiometry how I would have actually have calculated this. Uh, first off, you do have this written down. You do need a balanced equation. So... Our balanced equation looks like this. Barium hydroxide, ooh, there's two hydroxide ions here. Uh, so when you balance it, the coefficients are one, two, one, two. That is gonna be important when we look at this. Um, I know in our first section two, I don't think we ran into any strong acids or bases that had two hydroxide ions or two hydrogen ions, but those would affect your pH, pOH also, depending on how many of those ions are gonna be in solution. So that is your balanced equation. It's telling you to find your volume of known, do your mole ratio step, and then volume of unknown so that you can find the molarity of your final solution. So that is the answer we're looking for. Let's go work it out using some stoichiometry. So here's our equation. If we go back and we balance this, 2 HCl, 2 water. Again, this is a lot, this is basically a double replacement reaction. So, cation replacing cation, barium and hydrogen ions swapping partners, and that is your balanced equation. If I were to go back and write all of my known and unknown information into here, then underneath my barium, I have 27.4 milliliters, which is 0 0.0274 liters, and I also know that its molarity is 0 0.0154 molar, which is moles per liter. So that is the molarity of barium hydroxide given. 
in the original problem. It says it's added to 20 milliliters of hydrochloric acid. Well, those 20 milliliters of hydrochloric acid would be 0 0.020 liters. And it wants to know what's the molarity of our acid solution. Again, molarity is moles per liter. So that is what we are looking for there. Setting up our grid. Again, starting with a base, adding acid to it. Uh, so a little different than those equivalent uh, equivalence point charts that we saw earlier. Um, as I look at this right here, I'm going to start with 0 0.0274 liters. of barium hydroxide. I'm just writing BOH to be a little simpler for the amount of room that I have. And then you've got liters of barium hydroxide. I'm gonna go ahead and write it out now. And we are trying to go to moles of barium hydroxide. I'm going to put in the values that are given for barium hydroxide, which is 0 0.0154 and 1. That cancels. We are left with moles of barium hydroxide. This is where we do our mole ratio to moles of our acid, hydrochloric acid, and we use our coefficients. So the coefficients are 2 and 1. I know in my answer, I'm doing some cleanup here, that we need to find mole per liter of our HCl. So I want to leave the moles here and we need liters in the denominator. So nothing is gonna go up top. Uh, the liters of HCl we have is 0 0.020 liters and you are ready to do your calculation. So multiply the numbers on top, divide by what you see on bottom, and your final answer is still 4.22 times 10 to the negative 2, but in my calculator, I'm sure it brings it out as 0 0.0422 moles per liter HCl.